In April 1997, a woman's disappearance from a Philadelphia hotel left both police and her loved ones at a loss. When her body turned up almost 600 miles away, finding the truth became all but impossible. This is the Case Remains podcast, episode 15, The Unsolved Murder of Judy Smith. Judith Lois Elridge was born in Orleans, Massachusetts, a seaside town situated along Cape Cod where her parents owned a diner. She had two brothers, one younger, the other her twin, although later in life she would become estranged from them both. Judith, or Judy, got married straight out of high school, but the brief union wouldn't last for long. Her husband fled to Sweden to avoid the draft for the Vietnam War, ducking out without telling his new wife. Judy headed over to Europe to track him down, but eventually she ended up coming home alone. Judy found love again and went on to marry a man named Charles Bradford, who she worked with exercising horses at the thoroughbred tracks. Together, they had two children, a son, Craig, and a daughter, Amy, born just two years apart. But the marriage broke down before the children reached school age, and Judy was left to raise them alone. By that point, Judy was determined to make something of herself and to provide for her two children. She put herself through nursing school, dropping the kids off at the movies so she could wait outside and study in her car. Craig and Amy remember their mother as being very involved with their lives, even turning up at their summer jobs at Boston Harbour with donuts for the crew and going backpacking with them once they reached their 20s. She was driven to succeed and to do the best she could by her children. She qualified as a nurse and began working 70-hour weeks, eventually getting her family off welfare and even earning enough to buy a house in the Mission Hill neighbourhood of Boston. It was the mid-80s when Judy took on a position as a home care nurse, and she was caring for a patient who'd recently had surgery to remove a tumour from his throat. During the week that she was in charge of his care, Judy got to know her patient's son, a man named Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey had graduated Harvard Law in 1969, following in the footsteps of his father, who was a well-known New England criminal defence lawyer. He had grown up wealthy and gone through private schooling, a stark contrast to Judy's own humble upbringing. But in spite of that, they found that they had a lot in common. Jeffrey was divorced and was also raising a daughter, called Judith, on his own. Judy was a nurse, and Jeffrey's work was also in the medical field, representing the Northeast Pharmaceutical Conference, an organisation of researchers and executives from the eastern states of America. A little while after she stopped caring for his father, Jeffrey asked Judy out on a date. They both had an interest in theatre and attended a terrible community performance together. Perhaps cautious after their previous marriages, Judy and Jeffrey took things slow. They were together for seven years before they moved in together. Three years after that, Jeffrey broached the subject of marriage. But according to some of Judy's friends, she wasn't completely sold on the idea. There was a huge debate over even whether she wanted to get married, said Judy's friend Janet Shaw. She was saying to us, should I do it, should I not? It wasn't like, oh, this is wonderful. Jeff really wanted it more than she did. Truthfully, I think she did it to please Jeff's mother. Jeffrey's mother was in her early 80s when her son and Judy got married and was so keen on the idea, in fact, that she even planned and paid for it herself. Before the wedding, Jeffrey asked Judy to sign a prenuptial agreement, a request that Judy wasn't all that pleased about. She signed it in the end, but refused to read the papers. Judy and Jeff were settling into married life when they set off for a trip to Philadelphia in April of 1997. They were visiting the city to attend the annual Northeast Pharmaceutical Conference. Jeffrey, who represented the organisation, was moderating a panel, while Judy wanted to use the time to explore the city. They also had plans to go out for dinner with some of the other couples involved with the company and were going to head on to New Jersey afterwards to see some old friends. Judy was a seasoned traveller and very self-reliant, 
having gone to Thailand on her own and visited Europe on a couple of occasions, as well as the backpacking trip that she'd taken with her kids. But their journey didn't go off to the smoothest of starts. Judy and Jeffrey had got a taxi from their home in Newton to the Logan International Airport in Boston. When they got to the gate, however, Judy was turned away. She'd forgotten to bring any photo ID. Jeffrey boarded the flight while Judy headed home on public transport to go and collect her ID. She got a later flight and landed in Philadelphia at about 9pm that same evening. Judy got to the Doubletree Hilton, the hotel where the conference was to take place, about an hour later, and a couple of minutes after she arrived, she met Jeffrey in the lobby as he left dinner. Judy was embarrassed by what had happened earlier at the airport and gave her husband some flowers by way of an apology. They headed up to their room on the 24th floor, grabbed some pizza and discussed their plans. Judy wanted to visit the Liberty Bell and go see a movie at the visitor centre the next day while Jeff had a full schedule at the conference. With a busy day ahead of them, the couple called it a night. The next morning, a Wednesday, marked exactly five months since their wedding. Jeffrey was up and about earlier than his wife that morning and left their hotel room to go get some breakfast. He spotted a free continental breakfast laid out on their floor, so decided to go back to their room to let Judy know it was there. When he opened the door, Judy was just about to step into the shower and jokingly told him that she wasn't about to head to breakfast like that. Jeffrey said goodbye to his wife and left the hotel room once more. It would be the last time that Jeffrey ever saw Judy alive. Jeffrey was expecting Judy back at the hotel by five o'clock that afternoon to attend a cocktail party later that evening. But when Judy didn't return to the hotel by 5.30, Jeffrey was immediately concerned. It wasn't like Judy to turn up late, even by half an hour. He reasoned that maybe they'd got their wires crossed and that Judy had thought she was to head straight to the event that started at 6pm. So Jeffrey went down to the cocktail party alone, floating back and forth between the party and their room to see if Judy had returned. At 6.15, when she still hadn't showed... Jeffrey told a hotel concierge that he was worried something had happened to his wife. The concierge made calls to the local hospitals in case Judy had somehow gotten hurt during her day in the city, but none of them had any record of her. Meanwhile, Jeffrey held a taxi and drove around the streets of Philadelphia looking for his wife. It was only a couple of hours later that he called police to report her missing, and was told that it was far too early to lodge a missing persons report. With the police unwilling to help at that early stage, Jeffrey and his friends contacted the media. The next day, they reached out to a state representative and the mayor of Philadelphia, who had both spoken at the conference. That same day, the police department received a report from the deputy police commissioner, telling them that an investigation should be launched immediately. It didn't look good for Philadelphia to have a tourist vanish on her first day there. That Friday, two days after Judy had disappeared, a team of six detectives hit the streets, trying to find out what had happened since she left her hotel room that Wednesday morning. According to Captain John McGuinness, he put their best men and women on the case, including a former homicide detective with more than 30 years of experience. For the next week, they searched homeless shelters, trains and bus stations, psychiatric wards and checked the morgue. Staff at the Doubletree Hotel joined police in their search around the building, checking and rechecking stairwells, closets and even the trash chutes. The detectives followed every lead, no matter how tenuous. After finding out that Judy loved Asian food and would often eat it when she travelled, They interviewed dozens of people in Philadelphia's Chinatown, hoping that someone may have seen her in a restaurant. But Judy was nowhere to be found. It wasn't long before Judy's missing persons poster was plastered over the city. Along with the standard information, like Judy's age, weight and height, there was one item listed that Judy was rarely seen without. She carried a red backpack with her pretty much everywhere she went. She even had a nickname for it, the Red Wonder. 
As word spread of Judy's disappearance, the potential sightings came flooding in. But each sighting was stranger than the last. One witness said that she had seen Judy on the street right outside the hotel, chasing a piece of paper and laughing to herself. Another witness said that she had seen Judy at the Macy's concession in a department store in Deptford, where she had tried to talk with her about the menopause, an odd conversation to be having with a complete stranger. But Judy's family dismissed this sighting as unlikely. There wasn't any reason for her to take a bus out of the city to a department store in the suburbs. Finally, there was the city bus driver, who said that he had picked Judy up and dropped her off at the hotel at around three in the afternoon. None of the sightings in Philadelphia could be verified by police, although they could confirm that some of them were actually of a woman from a nearby town who bore a striking resemblance to Judy. A week went by and the tips started to dry up. With basically no evidence to work with, despite the number of resources that had been poured into the search, police were warming up to the idea that maybe Judy had never been in Philadelphia at all. They spoke to the crew members on board Judy's later flight to Philadelphia and none of them could remember seeing Judy. Not all that unusual considering the number of passengers they see each day. There was no one sitting next to Judy on her flight nor could any of the other passengers they contacted recall seeing her. However, the crew's headcount for the number of passengers checked in and the number on board matched up and police were later able to confirm that Judy's ticket for the flight had definitely been used. Jeffrey spent a further two weeks in the city after the conference to look for his wife, with Judy's two children also flying up to help with the search. Although Judy knew a few other people at the conference that week, the only person who said that he'd seen her was Jeffrey. This seems a little strange at first, but Judy hadn't arrived at the hotel until late, and then she and Jeffrey had pretty much headed straight to their room. Though her movements the following morning aren't known, It's not out of the realms of possibility that she would have left the hotel that morning without seeing anyone she knew. A policewoman added fuel to the fire when she visited their hotel room after Judy had disappeared. She noted that she didn't think it looked like a woman had stayed there, even for one night. But among the items found in the search were women's clothing in the drawers and the closet, and a bag of pink curlers in the bathroom. According to Judy's children, she wasn't really into makeup or jewellery and preferred to carry all of her essentials around in her trusty red backpack. However, the policewoman was also unable to find the outfit that Judy had apparently been wearing the day before, not even her underwear. It seems strange that after a day of travelling, including two trips to the airport and a flight, someone would choose to wear the exact same clothing. But again, Judy's children said that wasn't all that unusual for her. Stacey Vuong, who was working behind the hotel desk at the time, thought that she could remember seeing Judy that evening and did recall the exchange of flowers between Judy and Jeffrey, although she remembered it the other way round. However, she also stated that she had seen Judy in the lobby the next morning, illustrating just how unreliable witness testimony can be. Once she double checked her schedule, Stacy realized she wasn't even working the following day. A couple of months after Judy disappeared, police also stated that she hadn't taken a room key with her. They knew this, they said, because the hotel had told them they didn't have a key missing. But the Doubletree Hotel used key cards, not traditional keys, which were reprogrammed for each new guest. As a result, they didn't keep track of if and when the key cards were turned in so there wasn't really any way for one of the keys to go missing. The theory that Judy never got to Philadelphia never really went away. The implication, of course, was that Jeffrey had something to do with his new wife's disappearance. Judy's children certainly had no doubts as to Jeffrey's innocence. They're wrong if they think Jeff did anything to my mother, Craig said. He wouldn't, not in a million years. Amy added, Jeff is a completely honest person. He's a gentle person. If he says she was in Philadelphia, she was there. It makes me mad that there's any doubt at all about that. Despite the police's insistence that they had done everything they could, 
Jeffrey was frustrated by the police's search for his wife. On top of their suspicions surrounding him, they had also told Jeff that Judy's details had been entered onto the National Crime Information Centre database straight away. However, it later transpired that they had not done so until more than a month after her disappearance. As a result, any checks that may have been done in that first month wouldn't have turned up any results. Because police hadn't found Judy, they also began to insinuate that maybe she had just run away, which in Jeffrey's eyes lessened the public's interest in her case. But as he pointed out, even if she did run off, why would you go to Philadelphia to do that? Judy was extremely self-sufficient, so running off to start a new life wasn't completely left field. She needs very little, her son Craig said, and she's not afraid of anything. But considering the length she had gone to to bring up her family alone and to provide the life for them that she had, no one besides police thought Judy had simply upped and left. Craig added, For her to do this to me and my sister, it would be so unlike her, it would be like a different person. With no solid evidence, those close to Judy considered every possible avenue in her disappearance, hoping that something might fall into place. Naturally, foul play ranked high on their list, but they couldn't make sense of any scenario. Judy vanished in broad daylight, in the middle of a busy city, presumably in sightseeing areas. It seemed impossible for anything like that to have happened without anyone noticing. Being quietly whisked away by some ill-intentioned stranger also seemed so at odds with Judy's personality. Judy's friends and family repeatedly described her as very outspoken and assertive, sometimes blunt to the point of being rude. She was street smart and spent years living in a less than desirable neighbourhood in Boston, working odd hours for her job as a nurse. Her friends said that they would cringe when they were out to dinner and the waiter would bring her her meal, because if something wasn't right then you could count on Judy to make a scene. They all agreed that even if she was being threatened with a weapon, Judy would have put up a fight. Similarly, if she would have wanted to end her marriage to Jeff, she would have just come out and said so. Another theory was that Judy may have suffered some kind of medical problem that caused amnesia or disorientation. After all, this would match up with some of the strange sightings of Judy called in after her disappearance, such as the woman chasing a paper bag or chatting to a stranger about the menopause in the middle of a store. But Judy had been to the doctors for a checkup just two weeks before the trip, and she'd been told that she was healthy. However, that didn't rule out the possibility of anything having happened since then. This theory was one that Jeffrey began to lean towards. Convinced that his wife wouldn't have taken off of her own accord, he believes that perhaps someone in Philadelphia had tried to rob her and that Judy had fought back, sustaining some kind of head injury in the process. He spent a significant amount of time and money talking to neurological specialists, trying to figure out if something like this could have prevented Judy from contacting her family, or even causing her to forget who she was. Several neurologists told him that while it was possible, it was highly unlikely. Four months after Judy disappeared, with still no sign of her, a detective on the case publicly stated that if she ever was in Philadelphia, she certainly wasn't anymore. He couldn't have had any idea just how right he was. It was September the 7th, 1997, five months after Judy had vanished. Over in North Carolina, almost 600 miles away, a hunter and his son were out looking for deer in the Stony Fork section of the Pisgah National Forest. Suddenly, they spotted something, hidden away in a hole made by the roots of a fallen tree. Partially buried and wrapped in a blue blanket, there were bones. When they looked a little closer, they realised that they were human. The remains were discovered about ten miles from Asheville, a small city to the west of North Carolina, surrounded by the Great Smoky and Blue Ridge Mountains. At the time, it had a population of around 61,000 people and was a hotspot for tourists hoping to make the most of the great outdoors. 
The remains were located in an isolated area, the nearest spot being Chestnut Creek Picnic Area, located about a quarter of a mile away. Aside from that picnic area, there was nothing nearby, and it wasn't exactly a popular place. As a sergeant on the case would later say, if you didn't know where it was, you're not going to find it. If you pulled in at a grocery store and said, where's a nice place to go walking, they're not going to send you there. The remains were severely decomposed, with no identification nearby, and so the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office had the onerous task of finding out who the bones belonged to. Just a couple of weeks later, however, they received a call from a doctor that provided the missing piece of the puzzle. The doctor had seen one of Judy's missing persons flyers that had been sent out by her family, and had noticed similarities between the description of Judy and that of the bones. A white female, aged between 40 and 55 years old, and, critically, with damage to her left knee that would match up with Judy's arthritis. Dental records were able to confirm that the remains did belong to Judy Smith. Judy may have been found, but that still begged the question, how did she get from downtown Philadelphia to the North Carolina wilderness 600 miles away? As far as anyone knew, Judy had never been to the Asheville area before, nor did she have any particular reason for going there. Judy and Jeffrey had been to North Carolina before, however, and had visited Durham earlier that year. They had liked it so much that Jeffrey had even applied for two jobs at North Carolina colleges after their return, considering a career change from law to teaching so that he could spend more time at home with his wife. Detectives checked trains, planes and cars to try and figure out how Judy had made it all the way from Philadelphia to North Carolina, but couldn't come up with anything. Their only hope was that someone had seen something, or that there was some kind of evidence of the crime left behind that might point them in the right direction. Police descended on the crime scene, which took nearly four days to search. Animals had scattered Judy's remains, and in total, the area they had to search was the size of two football fields. Unfortunately, the evidence that they managed to recover gave police more questions than answers. Judy had been wearing a t-shirt, jeans and hiking boots, different to the trainers that she'd been wearing when she vanished, but also had clothing for colder weather on her person. Strangely though, they were contained in a blue backpack, not the signature red one that she carried with her everywhere she went. In fact, Judy's red backpack was never recovered. Reports on the exact amounts vary, but around $80 was found in her pocket, along with a further $87 inside a winter jacket. Near to Judy's body, there was a paperback book, a medical murder mystery called Flashback, written by Michael Palmer, as well as a pair of expensive sunglasses, which her family say didn't belong to her. Judy's engagement and wedding rings, which she'd been wearing when she disappeared, were nowhere to be found, although they were later recovered the next year when detectives returned for another search. Despite their efforts, they were still unable to find any identification or credit cards. To County Sheriff Bobby Medford, it suggested that someone had gone to great lengths to avoid Judy being identified. Judy's body was severely decomposed, and it is thought that she had been there since spring, close to the time that she'd initially disappeared. As a result, a cause of death couldn't be determined. From what medical examiners could tell, though, her bones showed no signs of obvious trauma, such as bullet holes or knife wounds. There were some significant cuts in her clothing, however, which suggested that she may have been stabbed in the chest. Paired with the fact that Judy was partially buried when she was found, the case was officially ruled a homicide. Police interviewed local hotel and store owners, including camping supply shops, to find out if anyone recognised Judy. Soon, several eyewitnesses had come forward claiming to have seen Judy in Asheville in the days following her disappearance. Joanne Stucker, a retail employee, said that not only had she seen Judy, but they had had a conversation where Judy had told her that her husband was an attorney from Boston, and that they had been at the Philadelphia conference when she'd decided to visit the Asheville area. 
She described Judy as being perfectly pleasant and noticed nothing out of the ordinary. Other sightings in Asheville included a woman who looked like Judy staying at a local hotel and even applying for a job at a doctor's office. Once again, though, none of the sightings have ever been confirmed by police. The theory that Judy had never made it to Philadelphia remained in the years following her disappearance. Due to the remote location that her body was found in, police believed that she had been murdered at the scene as opposed to being killed elsewhere and transported up the mountainside. Jeffrey was morbidly obese, with friends stating that he could barely move himself around, let alone drag Judy through a forest. The police may have had their doubts, but there has never been any evidence to suggest that he had anything to do with her murder, and no suspects have ever been named. For years, Jeffrey tried in vain to uncover what had happened to Judy, doing media interviews, speaking to experts, and spending thousands of dollars on private investigators. He scaled back his law practice because he couldn't concentrate on his work, struggling to represent criminal defendants knowing that his wife was a victim of murder. Jeffrey never married again, and passed away in 2005 at the age of 59. It's now been more than two decades since Judy was murdered, the passage of time doing little to shed light on this strange and tragic mystery. Unfortunately, it seems as though we may never know how this strong, determined mother and wife met a lonely end on the side of a mountain. But even in the least likely of cases, there's that tiny glimmer of hope that maybe one day we will. Thank you for listening to episode 15 of the Case Remains podcast. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can do so on Instagram and Twitter with the handle Case Remains. And you can also head over to www.caseremains.com where you'll find write-ups on missing persons cases and unsolved mysteries. Our latest post covers the disappearance of nine-year-old J.D. Phillips, who vanished from a California picnic area in 1995. I'd also like to take this opportunity to give a big thank you to everyone who's left a review for the podcast so far. I'm honestly blown away by some of your comments, and it also helps others to find the show. Finally, before we close out the episode, I wanted to introduce you to a new weekly podcast I've been loving called Real Life, Real Crime. I'm Woody Overton, host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. Join me each week to hear true and unscripted stories of the cases I actually worked during my career as a major crime investigator in South Louisiana. Go to realliferealcrime.com where you can listen to each week's episodes and find links to our social media. I appreciate y'all. Don't let me get you down on the bike. So there you go, guys. That's Real Life, Real Crime, hosted by Woody Overton. You should definitely go and check it out. Until next time, stay safe.